Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Good evening. Just in case anyone's confused and thought they were going to a talk by Lauren Summersgill, I recently married, so the name's now Bonnet, but I am the same woman, and we will still be exploring beauty and alienation in medical photography. I should say some of the images accompanying these slides might be considered upsetting to anyone not in the medical field. We might have some art historians there. However, if you are familiar with medical photography, very few things I imagine will surprise you that are here today. In this talk, I'm going to address a deceptively simple question. Given the importance of images in medical education and the universally acknowledged power of photography, why do medical textbooks contain so few photographs? To answer this question, I'm going to explore the troubled relationship between illustration and photography in the 19th century medicine and in culture using two key concepts, beauty and alienation. On your left, you have a cover image, this is just here, of Le Mécanisme de la Physionomie Humaine by Guillaume Benjamin Duchamp. And on the right, just here, is the cover page from the 1964 Atlas of Anatomy by J.C. Grant. Superficially, these covers have a common intention. They introduce the idea of medical learning through observation. Both present, present pardon, a doctor demonstrating a technique on a patient. In Grant's case, the doctor demonstrates to a watching audience of students within the painting. We can see them here. In Duchenne's case, the doctor demonstrates on a living patient to the reader, which would likely have been a member of the medical community. You can see how both are facing outward towards the camera, ensuring that the subject is able to be part of the image. In both texts, the cover reinforces the idea of teaching principles of medicine. The similarities, however, stop there. Mechanisme shows a photograph with an active doctor participating in the electrical stimulation of a living patient. An atlas of anatomy shows the famous painting of a corpse dissection. One book is an innovative experiment to categorize facial expression and musculature. The other is continuing a long-standing study of human anatomy. The 17th century painting in Grant's atlas underscores the sense of tradition in anatomical study. The teacher is informing the students, and additionally several centuries have passed between when the painting was made and the cover represents it. The use of photography and mechanisme suggests that we're in a new era, the physician was using what was, at the time, the pinnacle of technology. But if we consider the publication dates of these two texts, we encounter a surprise. Though Grant's was published nearly a century later, it does not contain a single photograph. In most disciplines, it's rare to find fewer photographs in more recent textbooks. For example, here we have two texts from the field of geology and chemistry. The geology text is, in fact, contemporary with Grant's Atlas of Anatomy, and it actually contains more image than its contemporary. While neither textbook here is entirely photographic, photographs are used wherever possible. The chemistry image suggests this. While not necessarily showing something specifically chemical, it gives a visible example using photographs of a chemical process. Now, photographs in textbooks tend to be very common. I'm sure we've encountered them all. However, this isn't necessarily true of medical anatomy textbooks. What's the story here? When first medical photographs were taken in 1840, the camera was presented as a revolution in medical education and in psychiatry and pathology. However, despite the popularity of photographs in other fields, medical photography became secondary to medical illustration. Illustrations were clearer, softer, much less messy. Illustrators could wipe away blood, extra muscles, tendons, and layers of confusion in order to reveal an organ or a complex system of capillaries in an idealized way. Photographs could not. 
They only captured the messy, grim reality of a difficult and bloody human body. So you might think, case closed. Photographs are not as clear as medical illustration. Most historians have followed that line of thinking. But I'm going to tell another richer story, one of power, class struggle, and dehumanization. Before I dive into my story, I would like to briefly acknowledge the complex history of medical illustration. There are interesting discussions and debates to be had about medical illustration and how much it's evolved. However, I'm solely focusing on its relation to medical photography today. So if you are interested, I'd point you towards these two books, Richard Barnett's Sick Rose or Ira Rutko's American Surgery and Illustrated History. Early medical photographs struggled with two concerns. They alienated the subject and they were ugly. Before I go further into this argument, the concepts of beauty and alienation need to be addressed, particularly because both are troubled with controversy. Beauty is a subjective and evolving concept fraught with gender identity and politics, and alienation in the context of medicine has a difficult history, especially in clinical medicine. Today, I'm considering both alienation and beauty as they relate to 19th century and early 20th century, and specifically in Europe. This is also the area of early modern photography and medical photography. Both alienation and beauty were used at this time in the context of maintaining and gaining power. Any discussion of alienation in medicine must acknowledge the work of Michel Foucault, himself looking quite alienated in this photograph. Imperialism, industrialization, and urbanization all posed vast challenges to Western colonial governments. Cities and colonies appeared to be overwhelmed with a variety of supposedly troublesome people. These were vicious savages, mixed-race children, hysterical women, criminals, lunatics, paupers, and revolutionaries. In response, seemingly objective forms of classification and knowledge offered by science and medicine were taken up as powerful tools of surveillance and control. When combined with new theories of evolution and a pervasive mid-19th century fear of physical, mental, and cultural degeneration, these techniques provided a foundation for the racial, sexual, and social hierarchies that were at the heart of Victorian ethnography and early eugenics. And a predominant term in these hierarchies, as in this talk, was beauty. For evolutionists, ethnographers, and eugenicists, the superior and the strong were also beautiful. I want to argue that debates over medical photography took place at the intersection of these two themes, a Foucauldian alienation at the heart of new scientific medicine and a mid-19th century vision of beauty as evolutionary superiority. As medical photographs became common in the 1860s, they drew partially on the conventions of medical illustration, but hope was that photography would surpass it. As Corey Keller noted in Brought to Light, Photography and the Invisible, the camera was seen as an ideal scientific tool. Quote, as a mechanical replacement for the draftman's arduous task of manually transcribing visual observations, and as a corrective for the human tendency towards subjective interpretation. The photograph was seen both to ease the requirements of the draftsman and to correct human interpretation. In other words, it was poised and expected to replace medical illustration in education as the more scientifically accurate medium. In particular, it was the mechanical aspect of the camera that was seen to offer objectivity. The machine, they believed, would overrule any human subjectivity by the taker. Furthermore, photography was considered a useful diagnostic tool. And unlike medical illustration, it could be used in real time. Photographers allowed doctors to consult from great distances and to do so relatively quickly. The first diagnosis by photograph was recorded in 1856 when Dr. Flewellen of Georgia sent a daguerreotype of his patient, this man, A.P. Jackson, with a large tumor, as you can see over his eyebrow, to Dr. Valentine Mott with a letter asking for consultation. He was able to send it in only a matter of days. The tumor was diagnosed and treated on the basis of Dr. Mott's reply. 
At this time, physicians used such clinical photographs to diagnose patients, and they also made personal collections of medical oddities and deformities, which is why this photograph was kept. Despite scientific insistence on the supposed objectivity of photography, the practice was originally in the hands of people without medical or scientific training. Physicians in the 1840s would bring patients to the photographic studio in order to make daguerreotypes, either for the doctor's personal collection or for use in consultation and in education. Patients were either typical examples of common illnesses, this would have helped students most, or examples of rare symptoms and disorders, often used in diagnostics. In both cases, they're ideal for reference or education. These patients were taken to the exact same studio someone would have taken their family. This meant that rather than relying on medical illustration to guide photography, the traditions and techniques of commercial photographs played a role. Though the doctor was usually present for photographing, and of course would have to explain to the photographer which area to focus on, the photographers would often assert their dominance as experts in their field. In some trade journals, photogra photographers actually asked for advice on how to deal with pushy doctors. However, this dominance didn't last long. Frustrated doctors as early as 1852 began to take their own photographs, and advancements in the 1880s brought cheaper photographic processing and the decline of studio medical photography. Taken in a photography studio in 1890, this image of Eugene Berry, a man suffering from elephantitis, is an excellent example of early clinical photography. Berry is seated in an armchair. He's before a set backdrop. The idea is that it would look like he's inside a home. He is inside a studio. And he's facing the camera at an angle that's supposed to make him look stately and proud. In fact, he's even dressed as though it's for a formal portrait. Berry is, in all ways, a normal portrait photograph subject, with one obvious exception. The large left calf and foot are propped on a small cushion, ensured that they're put at the foremost display. The simple arrangement indicates what separated medical photography from illustration. First, you can't ignore or hide the entire patient. And second, you don't need an expert or even any knowledge of medicine or medical illustration to produce a useful image. I imagine the photographer would have known exactly the point of this photograph. Medical illustration did not, of course, die out. Rather, illustration and photography were sent on parallel trajectories. Illustration would focus on the inside, while medical photography would focus on the outside. You'll notice that all of the photographs in my presentation will be taken of the living, whereas illustrations were drawn from the dead. While there are examples of autopsy photography and life medical drawing, this accidental contrast helps underscore the peculiarities between medical illustration and photography and what their uses eventually would be. This distinction brings us to the question of beauty. I should note again that medical illustration is, even to the untrained eye, tidier and clearer in its depictions than photography. I think this is an excellent example of how much and how little we can see in a photograph. That's why the internal structures of the body were, even in the early days of photography, largely illustrated. What physicians were most excited about with photography was microbiology, still in use today much in the way it was used in the 1860s, and the potential new fields of photography as diagnostic and pathological. The rise of medical photography coincided with another photographic triumph, criminal mugshots first used in Birmingham and Liverpool as early as the 1850s. Though in one sense mugshots are straightforwardly practical, they're a tool for identifying criminals, they also drew on a wider and, in modern eyes, much darker, set of ideas about human difference and hierarchy. The French detective and biometrician Alphonse Bertillon, widely identified as the founder of scientific criminology, believed that his codified photographic techniques could be used to identify a range of physical traits that marked out their possessors as born arsonists, thieves, or rapists, whether or not they'd actually committed the crime. Similar techniques were taken up by anthropologists and psychiatrists, 
the curve of an ear or the slant of your forehead could, they hoped, be linked to incidents of hysteria or to fix an individual's place in hierarchy of the races. The apparent objectivity of photographs we can see was part of a larger political project, the maintenance and order of industrial societies across global empires. In 1852, psychiatrist and pioneer in medical photography, Dr. Hugh Welsh Diamond, used clinical photographs from the Surrey Asylum in Twickenham to compile an image of mental illness that could allow the connection of physical traits with specific maladies, some of which are shown here. His study, founded in phrenology, was also used to ensure patients could be identified if they escaped the asylum. It was very important that you wouldn't mis uh, misunderstand or misinterpret somebody who was walking around the grounds. However, the true intent is evident in the title by which he, photo he published these photographs. The title is, On the Application of Photography to the <laughs> sorry, Physiognomic and Mental Phenomena of Insanity. In other words, how to identify a crazy person. He would argue for the use of photographs in treating and discovering the mentally ill at the Royal Society a decade later. In neighboring France, in 1856, inmates of the Salpetriere Asylum in Paris were photographed with electrodes attached to their faces. This was in order to create a visual compilation of human emotions. Here we're returning to Duchenne's Mécanisme de la Physionomie Humaine. This is what the cover of which we looked at in the first slide. Duchenne stimulated different facial muscles and photographed the results, trying to tie different muscles to human expression and then identify which expressions were normal and which should be considered abnormal. These could then be used to decide if someone, based solely on their facial expressions, were mentally stable, and in some cases, even criminally insane. Duchenne believed that the face and its expressions were linked to the soul, specifically that facial expression provided, quote, accurate rendering of the soul's emotions. Using photographs such as these to support ethnography here in Britain, Thomas Huxley established a system for photographing the human body using the rod of known dimensions. In 1869, Huxley then presented to the Ethnological Society of London, insisting that the colonial office should use ethnological photographs requiring a standard uniform measurement and a photographic technique in order to ensure it was a value. What value? Huxley's method drew on anthropomorphic measurements and on a set list of poses to be used in front of a camera, along with a measuring stick or rod held at the same plane as the sitter. Physicians are often consulted to ensure the photographic techniques would be used in psychiatry and medicine as well. Ethical questions of racial and class difference were often tied up in discussions of the, quote, ugly criminal. These photographs taken in mental institutions and often prisons contrasted sharply with well-dressed, well-groomed, and often full makeup faces of traditional studio portrait photographs. The ugliness of these individuals, occasionally stripped of clothing, usually unwashed and unkempt, made a great silent argument that the insane and the ill were inherently inferior to the everyday person because they were ugly. Being identified as ugly aligned one with degenerate humans, and it made you socially and biologically less than the beautiful. Huxley noted in a talk on ethics and evolution in 1893 that beauty was already an indicator of evolutionary superiority. Quote, Someday, I doubt not, we shall arrive at an understanding of the evolution of the aesthetic faculty, but all the understanding in the world will neither increase nor diminish the intuition that this is beautiful and that is ugly. End quote. His photograph seemed to back these claims. The evolutionary inferior did look ugly, and usually he's referring to facial ugliness, an area that photographs did tend to focus on. Ugliness, he argued, was something that could be observed universally. You didn't need medical understanding or philosophical readings to see and comprehend that gut feeling of ugliness. 
but this ugliness raised concerns of class. Statistics showed that criminals were largely of the poorer classes, and new hierarchies based on physical traits and evolutionary heredity suggested that this was a matter of biology. The poor were biologically predetermined criminals. Their deficiencies could be seen, so it was claimed, in their ugly faces. Many had rotten teeth, various diseases. They worked in jobs that would wrinkle, scar, or disfigure them. Often the poorest would sell their teeth or hair for a few guineas to dentists and wig makers. Their class and deprivation made them appear less evolved than the rich at a time when hereditary in thought suggested they were examples of degeneration of humanity, and at a time when imperial power and control was focused on rooting out social deviance. In these two photographs, we have a good example of this difference, where you have an obvious class distinction visible in the tattered clothing of the man in this photograph versus Huxley, who looks very well-dressed indeed and is, in fact, better lit because he was able to afford a better photographer. In this instance, of course, it's the medical protuberance that one immediately detracts from and wonders if it's ugly. But there are different layers here. We see a much sort of softer face and less kempt hair. Huxley's is incredibly well-groomed. His clothes are in tatters, and his face is grubby and not shaven. These things would have been considered scientific evidence, even though they're only a matter of social class. In the eyes of Huxley, Duchenne, and others, ugliness, as recorded in these apparently objective photographs, was a serious threat to the stability of society. Medical photography was not, however, limited to the asylum in the exceptional case. Initially, some physicians hoped that medical photography would replace medical illustration in anatomical and surgical education. The messy reality displayed in medical photography was fighting with the clarity in medical illustration. Medical claims for photography as an objective tool led to a change in these illustrations, embodied in Henry Gray's 1858 Anatomy, Descriptive, and Surgical, colloquially and better known as Gray's Anatomy. This book of woodcut medical illustration tried to be as objective and clinical as possible. Using the hand to imitate the neutrality of the photograph and the woodblock to ensure exact replications in each version of the text. Benjamin Rifkin, art critic, collector, and author of Human Anatomy, depicting the body and the Renaissance today, despaired that Grade's woodcuts did this too well, insisting that illustrations were, quote, utterly devoid of opinion or personality. Gray would have actually taken Rifkin's criticism as praise. His anatomy was demonstrating that the hand could be as neutral as a camera at a time when illustration was fighting for that right. It also offered clarity and aesthetic improvement, which photography couldn't. Photography also had elements of the past and future to it. The styles and arrangements were determined by painting and portraiture, the history of art, while making use of new technology. But photographs themselves, as we can obviously see, can be a mess. Before the ability to adjust shutter speed to change light or contrast of images, photographers had great difficulty showing anything as intricate, detailed, or internal as woodcuts. The process of photography was complicated and laborious, and anything could go wrong. A subject might move, and the image was blurred. Overexposure to light could distort the photographic plate and the slightest misuse of chemicals and developing process could alter the photograph's outcome. In fact, there was no way to know whether the photograph was usable in early photography until after it had been developed. The interior of the body in and of itself, even if a crystal clear photograph was taken, could leave shadows, hazy areas, and as we can see, is incredibly complicated to distinguish. Now, I didn't happen to have an image that was appropriate for the time period because most of them have been destroyed as unusable photographs would be. There are examples that were a little more unsettling, so I felt this routine photograph of abdominal surgery more appropriate. As we can see in this image, even with the advanced technology of today, including color imaging, which we must remember is fairly recent, one can see how this abdominal surgery is messy and shows how messy the human body can be. 
To a student, it might be easier, we can imagine, to study the drawing on the left, certainly if it's your first time seeing these things. When we consider the messiness of these images alongside the existing supposition that ugly individuals were subhuman, we come across an interesting problem. Medical illustration offered calm, aesthetic, clear visions of an autopsy and a surgery. Medical students were familiar with beautified drawings of wan and lovely women, waxworks that were compared with the Madonna. These were beautiful and idealized depictions of patients. Compare in your mind these images with the image of a face of someone you know who's sick, somebody who's just been through surgery, or imagine an actual corpse. Photographs present the reality of contorted, tired, exhausted, bloodless, disfigured faces. Photographs suggest that all of us are, in fact, as ugly as each other. So what then of the refined, elegant Victorian gentleman or woman when they became sick? The argument at the time is that ugliness indicated criminality or mental deficiency, so the elite needed to find a way to be both ill and not ugly. You can imagine that these would be a perfect answer to that. Medical illustration provided a solution, these beautified versions of the patient. Look at the waxwork Madonna. She's sick, she's being autopsied, but she doesn't look criminal. These examples present a case for clear aesthetic illustrations over ugly, unclean photographs. Furthermore, in addition to being messy, photographs also struggled to isolate the specific parts of the body and alienate a patient from the physical symptoms in a way medical illustration could. Returning to Grant's Atlas of Anatomy, this is the more modern text from the first slide, we can see immediately that anatomical drawings have not changed much since the woodcuts from Gray's Anatomy a century before, which was in the previous slide. These images clearly demonstrate the value of alienation in medical illustration. We can remove and analyze an individual organ, bone, or even circulatory system. Alienating these components is paradoxically productive. It makes them easier to study and understand. Using medical photography, physicians sought to alienate the disease from the patient in much the same way. In this 1890 cabinet card of an abdominal tumor, we see how the camera focuses in on the chest of the patient, removing features that might identify the individual, which also eliminated concerns of facial ugliness. While the chest identifies the patient as male, any other recognizable feature has been cropped out focusing in specifically on the protuberance. Today, we might be inclined to read this selective photographic framing as related to concerns over patient confidentiality, but this wasn't a main concern for doctors or patients until the 1920s. At the time, these photographs were treated much the same way as a specimen. It's related to the individual, but it isn't part of them. Doctors Daniel Fox and Christopher Lawrence, leaders in the study of early medical photography, noted that at the turn of the century, patients were gradually erased from the photograph, resulting in images such as this. This established a style of clinical photography in which subjects were increasingly photographed naked against a plain background, and often the parts of the body that were not diseased were eliminated from the print. Eventually, they noted, cloth would be draped over the naked section of the patient to ensure attention was entirely on the affected area, a trope that's useful in surgical photography in order to eliminate any features that are irrelevant to the surgery. Taking photographs that focused in on a physical manifestation of the disease while alienating the patient was dominant practice for almost 20 years, and as such, it's worthwhile for us to examine alienation as a source of power and control within medical practice, in particular in relation to the power of a medical gaze. In his 1963 book, The Birth of the Clinic, Foucault described le regard, the gaze, as central to new clinical medicine that emerged in Paris at the time of the French Revolution. The gaze of the clinician, the clinical gaze, penetrates the body of the patient to reveal internal structures of the body and to bring to light the, quote, truth 
of the disease to the doctor. The clinical gaze is described by Foucault as both detached and objectifying, in that it transforms the patient from a living subjective individual into a site of medical investigation. This alienates both the person of the doctor and of the patient. Quote, they are tolerated by the gaze as disturbances that can hardly be avoided. And in neutralizing the patient, the doctor rejects the patient's subjectivity. The objectivity of the patient and doctor are key, but while the gaze objectifies the patient, who Foucault rightly or wrongly assumed wouldn't counter the gaze, the doctor is in control of the gaze, providing him or her with power in that situation. In other words, the doctor created knowledge solely by seeing, through the act of seeing isolating the patient from the disease, and it also isolates the body from the individual and certain areas of the body from the body as a whole. Not only is the patient objectified, but they're often not viewed as a unified corpus. With the patient insignificant in the eyes of the doctor, the doctor becomes a kind of camera, an objective observer that can frame, can dominate the person in front of them, alienating them from their whole body and from the pathological processes within it. In some areas of medicine, we see value of this categorization that alienating medical gaze can bring with it. In relation to medical photography, we can see useful alienation in microbiology, which allows doctors to identify and photograph diseases in order to understand how disease works, how the body responds to it, and to identify potential cures. The struggle in clinical medical photography is how to isolate the diseased part of the body from the patient as a whole. In this tumor cabinet card, we see the attempt to separate the patient from their tumor. The head is cut off, focus is on the tumor, and identity is not part of the medical process. But the patient could never really be eliminated to the degree medical illustration offered. In early 20th century, medical photography reverted to the area it was most useful, depicting whole living patients. A major factor here was the experience of photographers in World War I. Here, the new practicality of handheld cameras put photography at the forefront of medical reportage. Much like the American Civil War, there was a desire to capture not only medical techniques and patients, but the experience of the war. This was influenced in part by the people taking photographs. Doctors on the front were supposed to be tending to patients, not cameras. So often reporters or young men who knew how to use cameras were tasked with this job. This meant fellow soldiers, if not friends, would be on both sides of the camera. This arguably could lead to a more sympathetic photograph one that took in more than the simple medical facts. There was also a desire by field medics and doctors to ensure photographs demonstrated the true horrors of World War I. This war brought with it new types of fighting, trench warfare, and heavy artillery, which produced appalling injuries, both physical and mental, including new diseases. It also brought with it great cost for very little territorial gain. There was a desire not only to relay medical information, but to relay the reality of a war few could imagine. As a result, photographs like this one, which may seem journalistic, are considered valuable medical photographs, even when they blur medical and emotional lines. In fact, this photograph is used as an example of treatment for amputation and rebandaging, in addition to the idea of having an open patient ward area while a useful medical photograph, in particular when amputations were so common, we can look at this and very easily imagine it in a newspaper. Photographs of wounded soldiers and amputations proved most useful to educate doctors about the potential hazards and successful results of new types of amputation. However, the style reverted back to wider photographic look at the patient included in his surroundings. Here, photographs use the entire body of the person to give meaning to medical images, which was in direct opposition to that medical focus on only small fragments of the body. 
In some ways, this style of photography, its concern for the human cost of war taken by a sympathetic photographer, foreshadows Foucault's critique of the clinical gaze and the value of the subjective in relation to the analytical. But that's a much longer talk for another time. My purpose in unpacking these stories is to raise questions about our use of photography in medicine. Photography, in the end, has fallen short despite the high hopes for it. And today, we use medical illustration more than we use medical photography. However, the history of medical photography also reveals a great deal about medical power. Photographs turned patients into objects, alienating them from subjects and then further alienating them from their disease and their entire body. Both as objective clinical eye and diagnostic tool, however, photography seemed to fail. Its failure mirrored failings of objectivity in some areas of medicine. Physicians tried to use photographs to make objective records of disease and its place in the human body, but the reality that photographers revealed wasn't clarity. It was messiness. People are complex, muddled creatures, and the idea we can separate any one part of us, a disease or a bone, is done at a cost if it can be done at all. Medical illustration has won out in teaching us about the human body and its various organs and functions, but photography shows what medical illustration hides, that nothing in people or in medicine is actually that simple that our desire to alienate and make the body clear, comprehensive, and understandable is simply a desire. While there is value to different kinds of objectivity in medicine still in use today, and I'm sure everyone in this room can't wait to tell me how, <laughs> there are more subtle and complex forms of objectivity that are in use today. It's not this naive camera-like objectivity. It's not associated with mechanical or a supposed, quote, truthful eye. That's what the camera and the clinical gaze offer. Let's return now to the comparison we began with. In 1856, Mécanisme de la Physionomie Humaine on the left, and on the right, 1964 Atlas of Anatomy. Instead of pitting these two against one another, let's consider them spaces on a timeline. We begin with photographs where a patient's individual muscles are being electronically isolated by a doctor in an effort to show expression and to codify human emotions and expressions. A century later, we have a series of medical illustrations designed to familiarize a doctor with different parts of anatomy, each isolated from the actual body in which they exist. The earlier text uses photographs to present findings as facts, and ultimately argues that mental illness can be visually identified. The later text uses images to alienate an individual patient from the body they have, but in order to show what similarities we have as a species, offering guidelines to doctors as to what to expect from their patients. On the one hand, we can see how far medicine has come, how compassionate medicine is today, and how willing doctors are to learn and be flexible with patient anatomy. On the other hand, there seems to be a theme of isolation within medicine, one that, perhaps, could have always been valuable in better understanding the body and its functions. But what of the space in between? Can we really say the rejection of photographs in a more modern text makes complete sense? I want to ask, did photography fail us or did we fail photography? The earlier text has photographs, the later has illustrations, but if we go back a century further, we have medical illustration again. We actually have very little difference between our current texts and those of the 18th century. Yes, a great deal more has been discovered about the human body, but we haven't much changed how we relate to, learn about, or understand these texts. Was photography a blip that showed us the dangers of letting medicine use objective tools or people claim objectivity? Or did we use photographs inappropriately, relying on a supposed objectivity to seek out beauty and alienate the human body when a camera is in fact designed to do neither? Photographs don't have much of a place in medicine today, and I honestly know a few people who think that they should. 
But when we look at the supposed failings of medical photographs, they were the failings of the people in medicine at that time. I can't help but wonder if medical photography really has had its day. Is there more we could discover if we tried a different approach? Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk slash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.